in the right place. This is the Eat Fluencer Podcast, and I'm your host, Dr. Maggie Landis. Together, we are going to unpack everything about eating and discover the what, when, and how that will let you lead your best life. This is not your doctor's conversation about nutrition. Today is when you can start to love eating again. Let food be food and you be you. Get ready to get eat fluenced. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Eat Fluencer podcast. Or welcome for the first time. If you are somebody new here, I'm Maggie Landis and I'm the host of this podcast. We are now into season two. Uh, It's a really long story, but season one was like mm, 14, 16 months long. And my uh, girlfriend Maggie here needed a little breather. So now we're on to a very much more manageable season two. I have 24 episodes scheduled coming up between uh, now, which is February 2021. 2021. Oh my word. It is 2022. February 2022 up through um, July. I have episodes scheduled for you. So buckle your seatbelt. Here we go. And you know, on this podcast, I have some episodes where I talk uh, more about the science and the nutrition research and the sort of clinical aspect of all these things. But I also have some episodes where we we do a lot more of this um, inner work, I want to call it. And that is what today's episode is all about. I have a guest today, Molly Goodman. You're going to love hearing from her. But uh, before we get to that, let me just uh, give you a announcement. I did a total and complete overhaul of my website, which is like kind of a big project when you're a DIYer uh, behind the tech scene. But if you haven't looked at my website recently, I would encourage you to go to uh, maggielandismd.com. The link will be in the show notes as well. Uh, And I have fresh, new, free resources, both for the discouraged future ex-dieter, as I like to call them, and health professionals who are working with clients really struggling to communicate with their doctors in a um, weight neutral way, I have resources for you too. So I would just encourage everybody, take a peek at my website. Some of the uh, information is new. Some of the pages are new. uh, Several of the downloads are new. And so if it's been a minute, um, go do a refresh. And I look forward to hearing from you there. But today we are talking with Molly Goodman, and I'm so excited to bring you this interview I had with Molly. I have to be honest, Molly is one of the highlights of my uh, clubhouse, you know, manic phase that happened about a year ago. And if you've been keeping score on the podcast, uh, I spent a lot of time on Clubhouse last year, and I don't actually regret the time because I made some very great connections. I learned a lot. I have since sort of backed off of that platform only because, you know, there's only so many places one can be in all the hours of the day. But Molly is somebody I met through Clubhouse, and she is a certified life coach who really specializes in body image healing. But Well, that's already sort of a very, you know, fascinating niche, but she does it in a different way because she has a history with art and creativity and uh, creation, and she incorporates that into her work with this body image, inner healing piece. And I'm not describing it even nearly as you know, to give it justice because the work she does is transformational uh, for her clients and for her audience. And I would love to have you hear our conversation uh, because we're talking about body image healing and creativity today. Let me read you her quick bio so you get a, a feel for her background. Molly Goodman is a certified life coach dedicated to helping women develop intuitive self trust. She guides clients into the gray area of life so they can abandon perfectionism and diet culture instead of abandoning themselves. 
using a unique combination of coaching, creative self-care techniques, and mindset makeovers. She teaches her clients to love and respect their bodies exactly as they are. It's her mission to help women honor their needs, observe their habits, infuse magic into everyday life, and expand into that next level version of themselves. That does that just sound makes you like, yeah, I want to hang out with Molly immediately. Um, when she's not helping clients ditch diet culture, she likes flea markets, watching Shits Creek, and drinking too many vanilla oat milk lattes. So hang on tight here. Here is my conversation with Molly Goodman. All right. Well, hello, Molly. Thank you so much for joining me on the Eat Fluencer podcast. I appreciate you making the time today to have this little chat. Of course. Thank you, Maggie. I'm so excited to chat with you. Yes. Well, so for those who don't know you yet and are about to learn about you and how um, really innovative you are in this space, the first thing I want to talk about before we get into the body image piece is how did you personally or professionally or both get into this non-diet work? Because this is not the default. We all know that. Right. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm just curious if it was like a, you know, a moment or an event or something, or it was a gradual entry. Yeah. I think for me, as I reflect back on it, you know, I often see it as very much a start and stop kind of gradual process where it was sort of, I was introduced in different ways. I mean, having grown up in diet culture, growing up the bigger kid, I am tall, I'm six feet tall, and I was always taller than everybody else. So I was always just bigger than everybody else in general. Uh, And I think going on diets when I was 12, going to Weight Watchers and doing Atkins and Then when I was 16, going to Jenny Craig and getting the prepackaged foods, I mean, I did it all, All the things, all the (laughs) things. things. And over the years, I would gradually be introduced to concepts like intuitive eating, like health at every size. And I think as my teen years got on, as my twenties got on, I really started to consume more social media and podcasts and things like that about those topics. But at that time I wasn't ready for it. Right. <laughs> I, I would hear those things and I would think to myself, yeah, but that's not for me. Like that's for someone else. Like, oh yeah, someone else can totally do intuitive eating, but intuitive eating is for weight loss. Or, uh, you know, I was sort of in that diet culture mindset still. And so even though I was getting some of those messages about doing something differently and, you know, opting out of diet culture, I was so deep in it that I just, I couldn't take it in. And I think gradually as I started doing more work in therapy and with my own life coach and going through the things that I went through personally, I really started to deconstruct and be able to hear those messages and like really hear them right? (laughs) to figure out, okay, like actually these are things that I can apply to myself. And starting to learn more about, you know, fat phobia and its roots in racism and just really opening myself up. But I had to get to a place where I felt safe to do that. And it took me a while to get there. But once it did, once I was there, it was sort of like the floodgates opened. Right. Well, and I, I kind of, um, really appreciate that perspective because I think a lot of people, it's too big an ask Mm -hmm. to like go all in. Oh, absolutely. And it's terrifying and panic inducing. Mm-hmm. And so the result is they just stay at doing diets because it's, even though they know it doesn't work. I mean, I'm not here to convince you it doesn't work. Anybody listening to this podcast is like well aware that it doesn't yeah. work. Right. Yeah. You know, but, what's up. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know what the problem is, but you just don't, you're too fearful of any alternative either because you're just not familiar. You're not ready. It's too fringe, whatever it is. Mm-hmm that, um, so it's okay. I mean, what I'm really validating what you're saying is like, it's okay to do a little bit at a time because it's better to do that and have it really internalized and really stick than to like, try to make this complete 180 and be panicked and you run back the other way. (laughs) Absolutely. And it's that, you know, I always say this to my coaching clients. I say this to my community all the time if dieting is your comfort zone, if this is your comfort zone, it's really, really comfortable 
until it's not. And when it's not, uh-huh. that's when you'll start to seek out other ways of being. But we are wired to want to stay in that comfort zone. It makes total sense. You're not wrong or bad for doing it. It just like, that's what you were made to do is to seek out the familiar. And so when diet culture and diets and counting calories and points and whatever is all you've ever known, you're going to more than more often than not stick to that. Right. It's really, it's not comfortable anymore. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It's, I mean, and I talk about how it's really victimizes us into this Mm -hmm. position of, like, well, it's going to get better. Like, I know this sucks, but it's going to get better. Mm -hmm. Or the next thing is going to be like the thing, the one that's going to save me. Yeah. (laughs) The Mm -hmm. the one, just like the last 37 different things were the (laughs) ones also. Totally. Well, yeah. So let me get into this, this, I see your specialty, um, as really equipping people with something to do in this healing process. Cause body image, I feel like body image is your wheelhouse. When I have questions myself about body image, how do we address these problems? How do, where do we find ourselves? Like Molly is my go-to person. So, (laughs) but for a lot of people that struggle with body image, which I would dare say is almost universal in women. Um, it seems like intangible. It seems like Mm. this concept that we have to grapple with, but how do you do something. So I'd like you just to introduce the idea of what you have found that works for you and for your, your community. Like we need something to do because a lot of this non-diet work seems really, um, nebulous. Mm -hmm. Totally. And, And, and it's hard to do that when we are trained in, like you said, counting, tracking, using apps and checklists and this and meters and all this stuff. And it's too out there and too weird to heal our body image. Right. Yep. But newsflash, it doesn't have to be out there and weird. (laughs) Right. Right. Well, you know, I love that you said that too, because while it is nebulous, there are tangible things that you can do to get into a space where you're able to tap into some of the things that may feel hard to understand at first. And, you know, I'll talk a little bit about, I, the first time I really kind of figured out that this method was effective actually became before I became a coach. It was when I was doing uh, art therapy. I've been working with a wonderful art therapist for years now, and I love her to death. And a lot of that was either just talking or I would draw a picture or she would, you know, give me a prompt and I would just kind of go to town on a piece of paper, either with paint or crayons or pencils or whatever it was. And I would just kind of let out whatever was in me and being someone that's a creative person. I grew up in the arts. I work full-time in the arts as well. I just, it's a creative person is just who I am. And as a kid, I did a lot of crafting and a lot of art. And it's something that I kind of got away from as I got older. But then when I got back into doing more of that and making things and using visual things to kind of explore my feelings, explore my thoughts, it really was this light bulb moment for me where, you know, a lot of people get stuck in this healing process because everybody talks about journaling or meditation or things that are very verbal, right? It's a lot of words. It's a lot of uh, processing these big thoughts that may feel really scary. And when it comes to art, when it comes to creativity, what's so beautiful about that is that you don't have to talk at all. You don't have to have the words for it. (laughs) You don't have to really come up with anything except a piece of paper and a crayon (laughs) or a pen or a paintbrush, right? And I remember so vividly when I was in a session with my art therapist, she has a portfolio of all of my past pieces that I made during our sessions. And she pulled it out one day and she started flipping through it. And as she was flipping through it, she was pointing out these consistencies throughout all of my pieces Uh that I hadn't even realized. And I think it was about the color yellow. It was something about how I saw myself and that that color was something that was really indicative of when I'm using that color, I am thinking about the core of who I am. And so she was flipping through the pages and she saw this color kind of progression throughout these pieces. And we started talking about it. And it was just this light bulb moment for me that was like, you know what, this is something that 
if we bring it into the world of body image, if you bring it into the world of, of healing, the way that you feel about your body, the way you move through the world, the way you eat, how you trust yourself, it really can open up a world for people that aren't the type of learners that are able to talk it out. They're not the ones who are going to write pages and pages in a journal. They're not the ones who can really even say what it is they're feeling, but maybe if they can draw or just put a paintbrush to a piece of paper, something can pour out of them that they didn't even realize was in there. (laughs) And I think when I realized all the work that I had done for myself with that type of healing, and then I became a coach and I started working more on just how to deconstruct all of this diet culture stuff that's so embedded in us. It really clicked for me that there are probably other people out there that just need something to do with their hands. (laughs) They need something to do and see in front of them to capture what it is that's going on inside. Because so often we get stuck with all of that stuff just rolling around in our heads and in our hearts. And when you can put it onto a piece of paper, it just feels so much more accessible to you. And so that's why I've sort of created this world where I really encourage my clients to do what I call art journaling, which is just to take out a piece of paper, take out your journal, whatever it is, and make some art. And it's not about the product. It's all about the process. And so that's my thing. That's what I love to do. Right. Well, and you know, I think that's, I'm the kind of person who like fears doing something wrong. I think, and that is a lot of that is diet culture, this mm-hmm. built in, you know, perfectionistic type yep. behavior. Um, when you're using art and creativity, I think there is this allowance for it to be kind of messy. Yes. And, and this is messy work. This mm-hmm. really, this is not the kind of work where usually for most people, they can sit down with a journal or whatever, and, and like neatly, like line item, bullet point, all their feelings. Right. Like, uh-huh. I mean, maybe some people can, but that's pretty, that's a, that's a stretch, I think for a lot mm-hmm. of people. And so the fear somebody like myself would have is like, well, I'm going to do it wrong. Like I don't meditate because I don't know how I'm going to do it wrong or I'm going to pray wrong, or I'm going to write in a journal wrong. Like everything is, has to be right. And with art, we all understand there's not a right way to do art, right? Mm -hmm. We all, even people who are not particularly savvy, understand that it's like Mm -hmm. individual. Subjective, yeah. (laughs) It's subjective and it's individual. And so there's this level of permission that I think Mm -hmm. people don't have with other stuff. Mm -hmm. So so what do you recommend? Now let's just talk some brass tacks here. Like if somebody, how, how would somebody who's like, you know what, this is an interesting concept, like, but I'm still a little intimidated with the idea of just a blank sheet of paper. Is there a, a process? Like, do you start with prompts? Do you start with, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? This is a weird yeah. question to ask an artist, no. but like, how do you create that art when yeah. you're inside and it's kind of tangled up and hard to express? So there's a- yeah, there's a couple different ways. Well, one of them is I lead monthly workshop series uh, called Ebb and Flow, which is all about art journaling. So we literally once a month get together over Zoom and I give art prompts. I put on a playlist. Uh, we talk about a specific topic and we basically just make art while we listen to music and people have their cameras shut off <laughs> and we just make art and then come back together at the end and we talk about it if you want to. Um and it's such a really, it's a healing space. It's a really supportive space. I just led one a couple of weeks ago that was really beautiful. Looking forward to the next one. And I think in that space in particular, and what I do when I offer this to clients is really prompts and getting people asking questions. So like the normal questions that I would ask of you if I were just doing one-on-one coaching with you, but doing it in a way that allows you to be visual and allows yeah. you to put something on the page and it doesn't have to be literal. It can be totally representative. Like we were talking about earlier with colors, right? You know, if you have a feeling that's just kind of bottled up inside of you, think about the color that is coming to mind when you, you know, imagine that feeling. Um, so a lot of prompts like that. I also find music really a great way to get into this artistic mindset. Um, I've talked about this a little bit on my Instagram before, but 
using a particular song that has meaning to you, lyrics that have meaning to you, something that really just kind of hits you and playing that song and really thinking about the lyrics and using that as a guidepost can be really helpful when it comes to making art in this way. Mm -hmm. So if you're intimidated to start, if you're like, I don't even know what to do, start with music, you know, start with something simple that you already know and just giving yourself space and time to just explore. And it doesn't have to be, I think the most important thing too here is that this doesn't have to be literal, whatever you're drawing, whatever you're making, it doesn't have to be literal. You can literally just have your pen swirling on the page for five minutes and you can release something inside of you that you didn't realize was there. And that's perfectly perfect. That's yeah. Cathartic. And you said it's the, it's the process. It's yeah. not, I mean, it honestly, you could theoretically just, I guess, like throw this in the garbage at the Absolutely. end or you never like, have to look no at it again if you don't want to. It to like, you know, frame it and like put it on <laughs> no. your wall or anything. It's mm-hmm. just, um, it, you know, it's a, I, I do like the idea of kind of keeping it like how you said your therapist has a portfolio. Cause I think there's mm-hmm. some uh, self-awareness with that, but mm-hmm. if that's too intimidating, if that's too yeah. like, embarrassing or whatever it is, then like be done with it. You know, but the the process (laughs) is very healing. So Mm -hmm. this, but let's talk about body image for a second, because we universally, I think are, um, so damaged by Mm -hmm. our, our body image, our body awareness is so damaged by diet culture Mm -hmm. that, a lot of women I meet, and I can speak for myself too, like, even after we made the decision, I'm not dieting, I'm not doing this stuff anymore. Like that doesn't go away. The issues Mm. related to body image. I mean, so can you speak a little bit to that? Like how important is it that we address this? Like it's, you can't just, I mean, you can't move past it really. It's critical. It's critical that we address it. And it's important to remember that we were all born into this system, right? The system exists and whether we like it or not, I don't think it's going anywhere. (laughs) Like it's, it's just kind of there. And it's important to remember that, that diet culture is a business. (laughs) It's an industry, it's based in capitalism and racism and fat phobia. And it's, it makes money off of our insecurities. Right. So when I think about that and I think about body image on the individual level, what I think about is the idea where you have to have a little bit of cognitive dissonance and you have to be able to go, okay, on one hand, I see the system. I see that it's harmful. It's not going anywhere. And that's my favorite word. And, and, <laughs> and I can still choose to operate differently. I can still choose for me, myself to, to do something different. Right. And I can choose to rewrite my story. I can choose a different narrative when the narrative you've been taught your whole life is that thin equals healthy, thin equals good, fat equals bad right? When you've been taught that it becomes so ingrained in your brain, but that doesn't mean you can't create a new story. It just takes time and it takes patience and perseverance to do it. Cause it is a story. It's not a fact. And that's the problem is what the first step is recognizing that all those beliefs are, Mm -hmm. are cultural values Mm -hmm. and cultural beliefs. They are not facts. Yep. And to me, I'm the scientist. And so that's where I was like all in health at every size and all this stuff because the evidence really points towards that way of approaching mm-hmm. body and food and eating and, and nutrition mm-hmm. and stuff. But yeah, recognizing that um, I like the ant, like this, this system sucks. It's totally toxic. <laughs> we right. didn't invent it. It's not our fault. And it, it may or may not change in our lifetimes. I hope it does, but you know, I hope so too. there's no guarantee of that. <laughs> right. So, and so what, what's our, I mean, we, you, you have the choice to mm-hmm. uh, participate or not, or to yeah. really um, decide that you want to conduct your life mm-hmm. differently. 
And there's a lot of guilt. Where does the guilt, Mm -hmm. I mean, so much guilt with all the years we spent doing this, Mm -hmm. or if I would have only known this sooner or, you know, um, how that requires some healing. I, the, the theme here is like healing, like this is a, you know, dismissing our thoughts is not really productive. No, it's about grieving. It's there's a big grief process around body image work. And I don't think it's talked about enough because a lot of what you see, especially on social media, right. Is this sort of like hashtag body positivity. And it's, you know, women in bikinis showing off their body saying, I love my body. You should love your body too. And if you're not there yet, right. If yeah. that's not where you're at in your own journey, that's okay. You, you may not get there next week, next month, next year, five years, 10 years. It may not be where you need to get right now. So I very much am of a believer that we have to be understanding of our own feelings and our own stories. And we have to honor them. And we have to honor all of the parts of ourselves that led us to where we are right now. Because I can tell you, as I think back on my own journey, yeah, I can absolutely think about myself 10 years ago and think about the girl that was so devoted to being the smallest version of myself possible. I can think about her. And right now I can think about her with such compassion because the other choice, like you said, is guilt and shame. And it doesn't serve me to believe that, right. It serves me to honor, like, yeah, there was a lot of guilt and shame in that part of my life. And now I can look at it and go, because I processed it, because I experienced those feelings, I let them flow through me. I used my healing modalities, whatever they are, therapy, art, coaching, whatever those things are, I used them to process the feeling and let it pass through me because emotions are just that, right? They come and they go. And it's our thoughts that dictate what our feelings are in our bodies. And so if you can reframe how you feel about those past versions of yourself, it can really help you let go of some of that guilt and shame that you were talking about. And it gives you the opportunity to reframe it in a way of, you know what? I have compassion for that person. I feel for that person. I know she was in a dark place or I know she was struggling. And yet because of her, I am here now. Yeah. I like, I like the, and there's your, yeah. and again, yep. and the theme really is neutrality in mm-hmm. my mind. What this speaks to is this idea that we have to approach everything as objective mm-hmm. and un emotionally invested as possible. And that Mm -hmm. includes, you know, I mean, when you learn intuitive eating, that really extends to food. But I mean, in this situation, we're talking about the past version of ourselves and Mm -hmm. how our actions and our things we've participated in and our long history with diet culture that like we were doing the best we knew at the time. Absolutely. Yep. You know, like my mom in the 1980s, like swapping out all the butter in her house for like margarine, (laughs) like that's Uh what she was told to do by people that were well-meaning. So like, yeah, my mom taking me to Weight Watchers when I was 12. That's right. She was told to do, right? Like it's absolutely the product of the system and it's, it's so much more useful and helpful and healing to you to be able to recognize all of that and to really zoom out and observe all of that. And that's what I talk a lot about too, with my clients is just really getting to that observation place where you can kind of see all of it yes. and move into more of a neutral space so that then you can decide, okay, well, how would I rather feel about all of this? Right. Right. It's not so emotionally charged. Yeah you know, and that's what I teach people all the time too. It's like, we, we just, it's such a Mm self-defeating thing to make a decision and then beat ourselves up for the decision. Like the, Mm -hmm. the bad decision is not even the problem. It's the beat down. That's the problem, Mm -hmm. you know, and judgment of the thing that you're doing, right. The thing you're doing. Right. Like that's so much. And that's how this whole diet culture thing works is like, really, truly, like, you know, even these diet culture people know that eating one cookie doesn't change your metabolism. They know that they're not Mm -hmm. totally dense, but (laughs) it's the, 
I ate a cookie. So now I'm bad and I have no willpower and I no wonder I'm like this and blah, 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 this, that whole narrative, Mm -hmm. like so much worse than the cookie. And that's what they have us believing. Yeah, you know, and so uh, being able to z- zoom out or step back or how detach or whatever word you want to use, like mm-hmm. to remain as neutral as you possibly can is like mm-hmm. so important. I'm so happy that you mentioned that. Um, so what are we grieving? I, you mentioned grief. Mm-hmm. Like, are we grieving like that? We're not all going to be thin or like, what is the, what totally. is the thing we're grieving? <laughs> we're grieving that we're grieving the life that you thought you would have when you finally had whatever body you wanted to have, because let's face it, people in our society who are smaller are treated better. (laughs) Yes. That is an an unfortunate fact. (laughs) And when I talk about grieving, it's not only grief around what your body looks like. It's about grieving the feelings that you think you're going to have once you get to a certain space with your body and starting to understand that those two things are not correlated, right? That you can have a wonderful, beautiful, fulfilling existence, no matter what size your body is. And that for a lot of people is really scary because it's completely backwards to what they've been taught. And so when I think about grief, it's about recognizing all of those stories, all of those things that just don't serve you anymore and really finding a way to let go of them, but also letting go of that narrative of what you thought was on the other side, what you think is on the other side of those last 10 pounds. Right. Right. And realizing you can have that thing. It's just not going to look the way that you thought it was going to look. Right. The 10 pounds is not the, the key to the magic door. Like, right. <laughs> yeah, we exactly. thought it, we thought it was, we thought, yeah. and, and there's so much that we put off mm-hmm. waiting for mm-hmm. that thing. Like, okay, yep. we will do and it, And it's, you know, big stuff. Like I'm going to apply for that job when I finally yep. can wear a certain size business suit, or I'm going to do this. And it can be simple stuff. Like I'm going to get I'm going to wear bright colored lipstick when I lose 10 more pounds, because then Mm -hmm. my face won't look quote fat or whatever it is, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's just like little decisions that we make all the time. And it's never enough. It's never enough because the person you think is going to be enough. There's somebody else that's that size right now. Mm -hmm. thinks they're not enough and is still not wearing the bright lipstick and applying for the job and doing all the things because they're waiting for the next thing. Like there's it yeah. never works out. I mean, the, the bottom endless, line is endless, endless cycle, endless. Yeah. Have you ever met a single woman who's like done that says, you know what? I am done. I am exactly the size that I have dreamed of being. I am doing everything I want to do. I have no second thoughts. I am totally like, that doesn't exist. No, <laughs> there is no such not thing. A thing. <laughs> no. So we're waiting on something that's not going to happen. So time is a resource you can't get back. Oh girl, that, that, yeah. (laughs) So if you're waiting, if, if you are spending your life waiting for that sort of magic key or magic thing on the other side of the door, you're wasting your time and not like, oh, you're wasting your time. Like it's a silly thing to do. It's like you are literally like time doesn't come back. And And I would rather, and this is the place I've gotten to and that I hope my clients get to and I help them do that. But it's a place that for a lot of people isn't accessible just yet. And that's okay. But it's this place of while I'm busy trying to distract myself with all of these things that are supposedly going to make me quote unquote happy in this smaller body, I'm wasting time and I'm losing precious hours and moments with myself, with the people that I love, with the things that I enjoy doing, you lose that. You lose sight of that. You lose touch with that. And so being able to come back to yourself and really investigate, okay, well, what is it that I actually want out of life and making that the priority (laughs) rather than how you look doing it is life-changing. Right. And you can think of other ways to get all those things. That's the exercise I work through with people. It's like, okay, you, you think that you can't 
uh, apply for that job, I'm going to go with that. Okay. I can't apply for that promotion or whatever until I lose weight because I won't look the part. Okay. Well, Mm -hmm. what does looking the part mean to you? Mm -hmm. Does it mean being valued by your employees? Does it Mm -hmm. mean being an innovative leader? Does it mean that you, uh, show up to work earlier? Does it mean that you make more money? Does it mean that you're whatever, whatever it means? Mm -hmm. Okay. So like, let's, let's make that list Mm -hmm. and work off of that list and come up with some things that could make you do A, B, C, D. And guess what has nothing to do with like losing weight or whatever. Cause you can, I mean, it just, we have to totally uncouple and like, exactly. Those things are not interdependent. Yes. Like the way we have been told, it's not your fault. You think they're interdependent because we have been told that we have been born into that, as you said. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's a, a belief system that can be changed. That's not a fact. Absolutely. And that's where so much of the healing takes place is once you start going down that path, of recognizing, oh yeah, I can have those things. Even just opening up the door to that permission of the things that you want in your life, having nothing to do with the way that you look, even just like opening it a teeny tiny bit (laughs) and just peeking through. Once you can start to do that, the rest of it starts to fall into place. It's not always linear and it's not easy all the time, but just opening that door just to crack can really set in motion this beautiful journey where you start to believe these new thoughts, these new ways of being. And it gives you such an open, open heart, open mind to really develop what your truth is. And I have been saying this a lot lately, and it really feels important to me to share this. It's this idea of, you know, when you heal your body image, you can finally embody your truth. Ooh, wait. Okay. Say that one more time for all uh, nice and slow. So I can, when you, (laughs) when you heal your body image, you can finally embody your truth. Yes. What does that mean to you? When you say that, when I say that, I mean, when you heal all the stories, when you recognize and you observe and you honor where you've come from, and you decide and you make the conscious choice to do something different and to honor your body exactly as it is and to take care of yourself in whatever way you decide is good for you, it opens up the rest of your life. It opens up other areas. It opens up things in career. It opens up romance. It opens up just a whole new way of being in the world. And it lets you figure out okay, well, what do I actually want? Because when you've spent a lifetime letting diet culture dictate what you want, (laughs) yeah, you can become really out of touch with, well, what do I actually want? (laughs) Right. And so when you let go of that story and you start writing your own story, you have to ask yourself, okay, well, well, what's my motivation? What do I want? What's in my story? What's going to go in the story? What's in my story? Who's the main character? Me, right? Like you get to be the main character of your story, but it's really hard to do that when you're embodying the truth of something else that you don't align with. Yeah. And so when you let those pieces go, you can get back to, okay, well, what does this mean for me? What do I want from my life? And you can go after those things in a way that feels really grounded and secure as opposed to that sort of like flailing and constant yes. chasing energy. Right. When it's aligned with your values, it mm-hmm. actually, you meet very little resistance, yes. like, like emotional mm-hmm. resistance and even mm-hmm. physical resistance. And, um, that is such an important thing to remember mm-hmm. that this is an intentional process, but intentional doesn't mean like beating your head against the wall, like in, mm-hmm frustration and, and, um, like you said, floundering or flailing, like Mm -hmm. it's like, you need to get your directionality, like get yourself Mm -hmm. sort of oriented. Yep. And then you just go, then you just start moving in that direction. Yeah. Well, and I've had clients come to me and we, you know, talked about this a little bit before too, this idea that body image 
it's not just about how you feel when you look in the mirror. <laughs> it's about how you feel about yourself as a person <laughs> and how you show up in the world. And when I have clients who have worked on things like body image with coming back and telling me, you know, our work together gave me the strength to, you know, quit my job and start a new career or, I was able to be really present with my family on vacation. I was able to tell my mother that I didn't want to talk about diets anymore and set a boundary, right? Like it's, it's this giant web that we create when we're able to open ourselves up like this, but it starts with that body image work because you have to let go of all of those pieces so that you can start building new ones. Yes. I love that. That is such a great place to land because it- um, you know, body positivity, love yourself, love your body is so, uh, wrong. I mean, it's, you know, that's a whole other conversation about how, where that came from, but it's just, it's not, that's not what any of us doing this work are advocating for you to just take naked pictures of yourselves and say, I love them and, and just stop there. I mean, that's not it at all. So yeah. Awesome. Well, you have given us some great, um, you know, really practical things to think about and do the doing, the doing, do, do, mm-hmm. do, get the paper out, get, yes, the pan- get it out, get the crayons out, get the whatever out. Yeah. Yeah. And where can people find you if they want to learn more about what you offer and what, and what kind of work you do? So the best place to hang out with me is on Instagram at Molly Goodman coach. And I would love to see you there fabulous. And the thing you're doing right now is this monthly, uh, mm-hmm. explain yeah, so what it is, an, the art journal. So it's an art journaling, uh, monthly series. It's called ebb and flow and it's hosted. I believe it's the second Sunday of every month for all of 2022. So the details of that are on my Instagram and you can sign up at the link in my bio cool. on Instagram. And yeah, I would love to see you there. Fun. Sounds yeah. so much fun. Well, thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it, Molly. Thank you so much, Maggie. So great, right? What a cool approach to this kind of work. And I love it because having your hands on something like a piece of art or a journal or whatever can make this feel like a real thing to do. Because I I can't speak for everybody, but a lot of emotional work and sort of inner work I've always thought was challenging to, I guess, engage in because there was no like benchmarks. There was no like anything in the outside world that showed me the work I was putting in. Cause it's like a lot of labor. I mean, it's a lot of mental and emotional labor to work through some of these issues um, regarding your body, your body image, your history with dieting, you know, these relationships that were forged in a really dysfunctional environment. But the idea of having something that you can put your hands on and express yourself, I think is genius. And if you are even have an inkling to participate in that, Molly is the one you want to go to. So I highly encourage you to go to the links in the show notes and uh, take a look at Molly's work and see how you could connect with her. And we will be back next week. You know, the Eat Fluencer podcast has new episodes every Wednesday, and I look forward to having you back here. If you take just a brief moment to give me a five-star rating on your podcast platform, uh, that is a little pat on the back for the work that I do here. But more than that, it is really um, going to help the podcast, you know, uh, internet world algorithm so that more people find this podcast when they're searching for these topics, which I know there are so many women out there searching for these topics. And I want this message to land in the right ears. So you can help me out by just dropping a rating and review. And I appreciate that. So we will talk again next Wednesday. Hope you enjoyed our episode today. Until next time. Thank you so much for being here today. If you love what you've learned, follow me on social media at Maggie Landis MD and you'll never miss a thing. You can also check out my website at MaggieLandisMD.com and sign up to be part of our community of eaters. Thanks again for stopping by. We'll talk again soon. 